In 1872, the Reverend Grant wrote, those who have never seen Superior get an inadequate idea of hearing of it spoken as a lake. Though its waters are fresh and crystal, Superior is a sea. It breeds storms and rain and fog like the sea. It is cold in midsummer as the Atlantic. It is wild, masterful, and dreaded. It's called Superior for a reason. Unforgiving, cold. It's often referred to as hauntingly beautiful. Maybe it was that beauty that many men came to explore, touch and feel. But Lake Superior needs to be respected or it will turn on you in a second. Thousands have died under these waters. Hundreds of ships now make the bottom of a superior a graveyard. This is the story of three men who will attempt to cross Lake Superior on nothing but stand-up paddle boards. Look at this, man. They're standing up to honor all the lives lost on the lakes. They're also standing up to raise awareness to keep our fresh waters fresh. And as deadly a superior can be, we owe it to this inland ocean to keep it as pristine and wild as it was centuries ago. As you're about to see, Lake Superior is unpredictable. But on this adventure, maybe not in the way you'd expect. to come up to Whitefish Point and, and ring that bell and it really set the tone for the spirit of the paddle. We were able to you know, really assess the gravity of, of what the Edmund Fitzgerald means to everybody up there. November 10th, 2017. Quinn Morris, Jeff Guy, and Joe Lorenz from Stand Up for Great Lakes came to Whitefish Point. This is the start of a goal but it's also the start of an emotional journey to cross the greatest of the Great Lakes. I think that going up there took it to a new level for me because I've been up there, I've been on Lake Superior, but being a part of that ceremony and uh, prior to that, just getting to actually paddle out there that day. It, it was just a kind of a almost spiritual type feeling. I can't really explain, but that took it to the next level for me. And going in the museum and seeing all the artifacts that have been found and all the history, and then seeing the bell um, was huge for us, but then being, able to, being invited to ring it choked us up that night and meeting all of the people involved in the shipwreck, the whole staff is amazing, the family members, and there was a pretty good snowstorm going on and the place was standing room only. Uh, that's how much not only the Edmund means to everybody, but what the museum means to everybody. too is they have their stuff together you know they say they're gonna do something they do it yeah and you know and Bruce they, is here they're and knowledgeable cool. yeah they're they're a group of people that's passionate about the same kind of thing it's uh, it's awesome yeah There's something about the water that we're all drawn to <laughs> on Memorial weekend 2018 <laughs> The guys from Stand Up for Great Lakes and members of the Shipwreck Society met for a safety paddle. These paddles are very important. The purpose of them is for the captains of the safety boats to get used to the paddle boarder's speeds. One of the safety boats was the Shipwreck Society's 47-foot research vessel, David Boyd. Looking at the cameras to see where the guys are on the, on the 
lords, idle lords, and... It's Captain Daryl Ertel. Watching out for nets. You see, the guys from Stand Up for Great Lakes planned across all five of the Great Lakes. Their goal is to raise money for groups that help keep the lakes clean and continue to tell the stories of these fresh waters. In 2015, they paddled 60 miles across Lake Michigan for the Alliance of the Great Lakes. In 2017, they made it more than 90 miles across Lake Huron for the Friends of the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. And in 2018, they chose the Great Lakes Shipwreck Historical Society as their nonprofit. The organization itself stood for everything that we stood for. I mean, as far as uncovering new shipwrecks, educating the public on the shipwrecks that they've already found, uh, getting kids in there. I mean, they've educated millions of people uh, through their museum and outreach program, so we thought it was a perfect fit. For me, there was a combination when I first understood what they were doing, um, when I really first started considering what they do. Uh, it, it amazed me, and it, there was a little bit of disbelief, too, when you think about crossing a Great Lake on a paddleboard. It doesn't seem possible, and the fact that they would consider uh, a donation to our organization too was something that we were, all of us were humbled by. Uh, but the idea of also doing something greater or bigger than us, uh, you know, discovering these shipwrecks and telling the stories of the people that came before us, that's, I consider that to be a really big part of what we do. But to extend that to help and care for the Great Lakes and um, protect them is something even bigger yet. So we were all very excited at, the, at the, the thought that we could be a part of this. And it also puts it into perspective what it is that we're about to do and, and what it means. And that was really the doorway to this whole paddle. Great Lakes Shipwreck Historical Society. We are a nonprofit, 501c3, and there's a lot of different things that we do. We interpret history of the Whitefish Point Light Station up here at Whitefish Point. We interpret the history of the shipwrecks all over the Great Lakes, but primarily here on the Shipwreck Coast, Lake Superior. We interpret the history of the life-saving service that was up here on the Shipwreck Coast as well. And probably one of the most interesting things that we do is we actively search for shipwrecks on the Great Lakes. And again, primarily up here in the Lake Superior area. So if you combine all of these and add an historic Weather Bureau building from 1899 in Sault Ste. Marie, you have the primary works of the Great Lakes Shipwreck Historical Society. If you've never been to the Shipwreck Museum at Whitefish Point, you might want to consider a visit. It's a beautiful place where you can go to relax and reflect. This place means so much to so many, it's hard to put into words. Weirdly, it's kind of a sad place too. When you go through the museum and read about all the wrecks that have went down off the shipwreck coast, you can't help but feel melancholy. But maybe that's what makes Whitefish Point so special. These stories tie us all together. They go back to the founding of our country. There's a lot of museums that, that tell the stories of shipwreck and uh, you know the, the inherent tragic circumstances typically behind these shipwrecks. But I think we're one of the very few organizations that are out there interpreting this history, but at the same time, while going out and looking for these shipwrecks. And each time we find a shipwreck, and we found quite a few of them as an organization, each time we find a new one, this is opening up a whole new kind of Pandora's box of, uh, of stories. Like a wreck they found in 2014. When we found the Nelson in 2014, this is a schooner. It was originally built as a barkentine in 1866 in Milwaukee. It sank in 1899, and human eyes hadn't seen that shipwreck until 2014 after that. So we started telling that story, and a lot of people were very interested in this. And a lot of people who had family connections to that shipwreck as well. There was a woman in Texas who was the great, great, great granddaughter of Captain Hagany. It was very personal. But we also had a call uh, from a woman at Central Michigan University. And her great, great uncle, I think I have this correct, was the first mate on board the Nelson. So of a crew of maybe 10, nine or 10, here we had two 
families contacting us. So they certainly had family connections, emotional connections, and this woman remembered her grandmother talking about that story. Family ties that go back over a century, and in an infamous kind of way, the tragedy of the Edmund Fitzgerald almost being the gateway for people to learn and pay respect to all the other shipwrecks and their stories. Most people aren't aware of these shipwrecks. They're aware of the Edmund Fitzgerald, maybe one or two other wrecks, but typically it's just the Edmund Fitzgerald. And while that's a very important shipwreck, uh, there's just all these other stories to tell, and they're right on our back doorstep. So now Stand Up for Great Lakes had their nonprofit in place. A route needed to be planned for the paddle. They wanted to do something special to honor the crew of the Edmund Fitzgerald and all the other wrecks that have went down. We decided, like, yes, we have to include the Fitzgerald. The last probably year, I'd, I had been staring at the map, trying to find a route, and there's not really a natural route like directly across unless you go 120 miles or something. So wanting to end at Whitefish, incorporate the Fitzgerald, I mean, that sort of made our decision we want to end there. Then it was trying to find the starting point. But there was just one problem. Going over the Edmund Fitzgerald is not allowed by the Canadian government. Probably most people don't even know that. You're not allowed to be on top of the Fitzgerald. You can't drive your boat across it or anything. The group applied for and received a permit to do a special ceremony over the Fitzgerald. Quite an honor from the Canadian Ministry. Once we had that permit, that was a very big honor that the government gave us that. And that made it possible for us to kind of finalize our route. The route ended up being unconventional, two-thirds of a triangle. They would start in Sinclair Cove, just south of Wawa, Ontario, then paddle to the Fitzgerald site, then 17 more miles to Whitefish Point. A weather window was set between July 9th and 20th. If the wind didn't set up perfectly for the guys between those dates, the trip was off. Now the only thing in their way was time. The day was almost here. The weather was setting up perfectly. After a bunch of phone calls, everybody headed to Canada. Well, we're in Botswana Bay. We're on the brink of our third crossing, our Lake Superior. All day, the nerves have been going crazy, like pit sweating. It really hasn't hit. I think once we hit the cove tomorrow and we actually have our boards um, and our dry suits on, that's, I think, it's gonna be the scary moment. Right now, it's just excitement. The safety boats had to leave Whitefish Point to get to Sinclair Cove, Ontario. The ground crew and Quinn, Jeff and Joe staged at Voyager's Cookhouse on Batchewana Bay. We had to stay here. This is the nearest hotel to our crossing, which is 88 kilometers, about 50 some miles. Everything worked out perfectly. So we get up there and get the boards out and everybody is so excited, there was just this buzz in the air. Jeff was talking to two people on the deck and they saw our board sitting there and they're like, oh, so where are you paddling? I said, well, we're gonna end in Whitefish Point. And they said, straight across from, from here? I said, well, yeah, we're going across, but we're actually starting 50 miles north of here. What, are you serious? So then I, I explained it to them, you know, that we had crossed Lake Michigan and Lake Huron and they actually thought it was really cool. And I explained stand up for Great Lakes and why we do the paddles and how we wear dry suits and are very safe and everything. So they thought it was awesome. Do you wanna try some? No, thank you. It's good. It looks good. But In I just hours, the guys would have to face a 24 hour paddle sleep was important. I'm gonna to try to get a good dinner and, and get a good night's sleep and um, come out fresh in the morning and, and go. It's about 11.50, I'm gonna get up early tomorrow. Can't sleep. The lake was glass, the fog was not super thick, but it was just like enough to make it unforgettable. In the middle of Lake Superior Provincial Park, just south of Wawa, Ontario, the guys from Stand Up for Great Lakes started their adventure at a very foggy Sinclair Cove. Wow, this is awesome. 
both safety boats waiting offshore. Quinn's brother, Tyler Morris's boat, and the Shipwreck Society's David Boyd, both ready to go. And I scream as I'm coming down the ramp, you know, and the boats are all pumped up, and it's the first time I saw you and our captain and our EMT and my brother, and seeing them, you just get this, like, emotional, let's do this. Oh, it's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah, I couldn't ask for a better. The fog is great. Love the fog. This is crazy. Like, this is nuts. So I'm amped. I remember I got there, got my board unloaded. You can just see like the outsides of the cove. And that was amazing. That really like, you know, okay, it's go time. That place was so cool. And to start out in the fog was, I think was pretty neat. If you look behind Joe, that's Tyler Morris and EMT Mike Sanders in the water. They decided to take a dip before the trip started. That's also when the temperature superior drove a point home to Mike. Dove in and, and uh, we knew the surface temperature was 58 degrees, but I can tell you about six inches under the water, the surface temperature on superior is, is a lot colder. And uh, you know, instantaneously it, it drove home the fact that we were in a hostile environment and we would be for the next 28 hours, you know, that, you know, games were over and uh, it was about to get real. <laughs> On their boards, food, lights and drinks and a very special tribute. Our goal is to leave Sinclair Cove and head out to the Edmund Fitzgerald. And what we wanted to do is something special when we go over it. What we're doing is we're paying our respects to the to the Fitz, oh, yeah. but also we're paying our respect to the sailors that have gone down. So we have 29 carnations on the uh, actual wreath, which is 100% biodegradable, and it'll float. Uh, and then we have one single um, that'll represent all the other ships and sailors that have gone down on all the Great Lakes, but also in Superior especially. So. Love you. One from you and one from Melissa. They were ready to go. Always an emotional moment for the people who love them. And then, you know, we're hugging our girlfriends, wives, uh, family, and they're all crying, you know, so you're trying to stay strong because you don't want to show that you're scared too, but definitely, definitely panic mode. Be the turtle. You know, you never know what you're going to hit, and we thought it was going to hit us with everything. More than 60 miles was ahead of them. But the first 20 minutes of this paddle may have been the most significant because of what this place means. Probably one of the most beautiful, rugged places that you've seen, especially from a boat, and it didn't disappoint. We just started our journey across Lake Superior. This part of the Canadian shoreline is stunning. It was so beautiful. There's this huge like cliff to the side. It was something out of like a mythology storybook. The fog was dense enough to where we couldn't see 100 yards, which made everything that much more interesting because every 100 yards you're seeing new terrain, new terrain. And as we came out of the, of the cove, going to the south towards our, towards our left were the Indian pictographs. And the walls that these are on, again, are just, to, you know, to see it is just amazing. Agua Rock is a sacred place to the Ojibwe. For generations, they would come here to record their dreams, visions, and events. Painted on the rock are centuries-old paintings. Moose, bear, deer, caribou, and other creatures. The Ojibwe also painted paddlers in a canoe. Right by those paddlers, there's a horned animal called Mizupishu. He's known as the Great Lynx, or Spirit of the Water. Mizupishu has two sides. He could either provide safe passage for humans by calming the waters, or he could turn on you and bring storms by thrashing his tail. So to be able to start there and somewhere that sacred to the natives and seeing it that calm, that foggy was just like so overwhelming emotionally that um, I teared up just looking at the, the paintings there, for real. It was the perfect way to start. And it, it again, just there's so many different parts of this paddle that had more meaning than just starting and finishing. It was anybody's guess what Mizupiju would provide for Quinn, Jeff, and Joe over the next 24 hours but they were about to find out. The lake just welcomed the guys like, I've never seen anything like that.
The start of these paddles are almost like a party. Spirits are soaring. We are flying and the fog starts lifting as we're leaving. It is perfectly glassy. You never see Superior like that. And the whole time we're sitting here thinking, all right, this is a great start. You know, that nothing can take this away from us, no matter how rough it gets. You're swimming in the middle of Superior. And the spirit of the water was being nice. You look back and you could see, still see the cliffs in the island. And it was that fog bank was still like protecting that sacred location. We got out of it and it was almost like a blessing for our trip. You know, someone was definitely looking out for us on this one. We're coming along the island and it was just almost unbelievable how calm the water was. And we had maybe this like tiny little breeze coming at us, but we were just slicing through it. And I'm thinking to myself, right, this is nice, but you know, we're gonna get into some harder stuff later. Really could have been any better, you know? We never expected it to be that way. Superior is always the one that everybody talks about being unpredictable, and um, it was unpredictable because that was the last thing that anybody would have predicted to happen. So it really did end up doing the least predictable thing it could have by just giving us just a big sheet of glass the entire time. The guys were flying across the water faster than they've ever started a paddle. And that may be because of another Chippewa legend written about by author Lauren Graham in his book, A Face in the Rock. Quinn has a saying on his board, Shimon Pole. This legend starts on Grand Island. One of the legends of the Grand Island Chippewa was that when you're in your canoe, and you're out in the lake, and let's say a storm is beginning to shape up or something, and you want to go faster, that what you should do is slap the side of your canoe and say, Shimon Pole, Shimon Pole. And that would make your canoe go very fast. In fact, so fast that you could use it to explore Lake Superior. And they were moving faster. Uh, our Colorado fish just jumped right there. When we set off from Sinclair Cove, their speed was 2.6 miles per hour. And then by about 11, 12 o'clock in the day, they were at 3.4 miles an hour. Around noontime, it was starting to sink into me that this was gonna be a paddle of the lifetime for them. Uh, they were running into a unique event that would probably never be duplicated. Though their energy was high, every hour they took about a 10 minute break to recharge. And each one of them has a different and interesting way of taking their breaks. They all have each of their own characteristics. Joe is uh, being the personal trainer. You know, he starts digging right into his boxes, uh, his waterproof boxes and, you know, getting some drink and getting food and kind of sorting it out, what he's going to be doing, and Quinn. This is the best pizza pizza I've ever had. Kind of plops down on the board and sits with his legs in the water and uh, starts eating and talking. We got Joe over here. <laughs> got Pim Daddy. He's back. <laughs> the last, last time on this, uh, on this journey, Jeff was not smiling, so it's good to see that smile. Look at that beautiful shoreline. And Jeff is uh, probably the most laid back on the break because he looked like he was in a recliner all the time. He would immediately just assume the position of relaxation on the board, and uh, he had it right. He had it all bounced out right, and uh, he could access his water and his food and just kind of chill. They do a lot of different things when they have the opportunity at those breaks because it is a couple minutes away from the focus of, of the paddling at hand and it is an opportunity to take in those moments and you know just even though in seven to twelve minutes but that's seven to twelve minutes of hey I'm out in the middle of Lake Superior you know miles from shore and I'm sitting here eating a sandwich on a paddleboard. <laughs> I mean how great is that? And they weren't the only ones relaxing and eating. 
On board the David Boyd, there was a stowaway of sorts. Before the Boyd left Whitefish Point, some barn swallows had built a nest on board, and a fledgling had just hatched. Our captain, Daryl Hartell, came up with a plan. When we left on this trip, we knew we were going to be gone for about 36 hours, probably total, and the parents did not follow us, so I knew the baby bird didn't have a chance. So I got with Bruce and we removed the nest, brought it in to the cabin, put, a, put it into a box, and so we started feeding it. And everybody was teasing me in the beginning, but before the end of the trip, everybody was killing flies and bringing them in and feeding the bird. So the bird was eating, had a healthy appetite. Something floating in the water over there. I'm gonna go check out, see what that is. Back on the water, the guys were coming across something you'd think wouldn't be in the middle of Lake Superior. So in the middle of Lake Superior, we find a big piece of plastic out here. Okay. Sad, dude. But that's a huge problem. I think going forward, that's going to become one of our biggest of initiatives of Stand Up for Great Lakes is this plastic issue. Got to run. Little microplastics everywhere in the most remote part of the Great Lakes. It just shows like they are not only in trouble, but we got to do something about that. It has some weight to it, you know, that even out there, it's still littered. But it also reinforces what and why we're doing this. They were also finding logs floating on the surface. Quinn, who was a middle school science teacher, found this one and put it on his board. So I have a log, found it in the middle of the lake. I'm going with it's a mammoth bone, but it's pretty much just a float log. And I'm gonna put a plaque on it and put it in my classroom and that's my souvenir for the trip. Later that day, they even picked up this massive log that could have easily pierced a hole in a boat. My brother ended up picking it up on the boat and then they put it on the David Boyd, but when Jeff first saw it, he thought it was like an old sail from a shipwreck. They were about five hours from the site of the Edmund Fitzgerald. And with everything that was going on, the fun, Woo -hoo! Woo -hoo! the unbelievable smooth water, and even cleaning the lake up a bit, some things may have been forgotten. I'm not gonna lie, he's starting to feel it a little bit in the shoulders and the elbows a little bit. Uh, definitely that four hours of sleep last night. Uh, it's hitting me right now. Hitting Safety me. Captain Ryan Matuzak noticed the change in Quinn. Uh, you're sweating more than you can smell. Yeah. But this is part of what we do out here. Yep. That's yep. not act surprised, right? Yeah. It's just this filter. I'm only being able to get like a little bit at a time. Okay. Well. In that last break, I hit the wall pretty good there. Not like physically as much. Just, we're not mentally, but like just like down a little bit. Quinn was dehydrated, something that could have been prevented. these water straws to drink right out of the lake for hydration. Quinn never cleaned his out after crossing Lake Huron last year. He barely had 20 ounces of water since 8 a.m. Ryan was the first one. He comes up to me. He says, hey, what's up? You know, why are you, why are you, and are you dehydrated? And I was like, yeah, probably. So Quinn's got just a little bit of de dehydration going on, so we're going to stretch this out a little bit, just a little bit longer. You know, last break, he told me that he was feeling it. He's never told me he's felt it in any of these events. So. Then I started questioning. Like, he realized what I was doing, and you could hear the frustration in his voice. He just said, Mike, I'm drinking enough. I'm drinking enough. I'm OK. Quinn's quite an athlete, and uh, I think he, uh, he realized where he was at and was, was kind of, I don't know, uh, frustrated with himself. And after a long time, you don't realize it, but in that sun, and you're paddling, you're losing a lot of fluid. I was losing more fluid than I was taking in. And I think it was such good weather and so calm that I, I forgot to do the most important thing, which is take care of yourself first. 
No harm, no foul, but that's the exact reason why Ryan Matuzak and EMT Mike Sanders are on these trips. They look after the guys during these paddles. Mike and Ryan will let them go to their limits, but if they're in trouble, they can pull them. The biggest part about paying attention to our guys on the boards is, is body language, of course. You know, we're talking and we're communicating. Um, if we lose communication and they start getting really quiet, you know, that's a pretty good indication that maybe we need some water or a break or maybe they're just working through something at that time. Um, I don't, if they start falling off or something like that happens, we don't say anything to them right away. We watch them because the agreement we've got between each other is that we're gonna try and, and get through this and, and make this a successful event. Sometimes you have to be tough, you know? Look where you're at. You're in the middle of a lake, a huge lake, a great lake. It's not going to be easy. It's pretty amazing just really to think about it. Um, I mean, I've seen these guys where I thought they were going to die, you know, and uh, it's pretty amazing just to, to know that, that they get through it by digging deep, by relying on one another, and then, of course, knowing that we got a team right there to back them up. The men from Stand Up For Great Lakes were about 11 hours in on their journey across Lake Superior. They weren't that far from the site of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Lake Superior was still surprisingly calm, like a sheet of glass, a canvas nature could paint. In the middle there, you get like, you get this look of the water where it's just like liquid mercury, just kind of just changing and undulating. And there's not, it's like there's, the whole water just has like two or three different colors to it, you know, and it just kind of changes back and forth, these, you know, dark blues and grays. I was really surprised to see that on Superior at all, let alone the entire time. See that? What? There's like this, yeah, the red waters. sliver yes. right on the horizon. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Do you see it, Ryan? Oh, that, absolutely. Hey, Quinn, check right out here. that red sliver. As we headed to the Fitzgerald site, what is it? and mind you, they kept accelerating across the lake. By the time we were a mile out from the Fitzgerald site, they were doing four and a half miles an hour, just cruising across this glass. And we turned on uh, Gordon Lightfoot. loud. I think they were probably making over five knots over that last mile, just cranking, cranking out the strokes. The scene was really unfolding dramatically. We had super high anticipation. You know, we had just been paddling all day, so we're getting, we're getting amped up as we're getting closer. Approaching it, and you have the sunset off to your right, and it's a little hazy, and the day's been perfect, almost blessed for this occasion. I have this wreath on the back of my board that we're about to place down. And to know like what those sailors were going through at that point in the lake, literally you were there. 43 years ago, a terrible accident happened right here. 29 men lost their lives. Quinn, Jeff and Joe's excitement turned somber. It hit me really the most, you just like fully realizing we're above the Edmund Fitzgerald, like literally a above it and everybody that was on board, they're down there. That really brought it home that we actually did have the opportunity to do something meaningful for these people right above them. We came together and we had our boards almost in a triangle. We put a wreath with 29 carnations um, on each of our paddles, we lowered it down into the water, and then we threw, uh, Joe threw a, a 30th flower out there too. And um, we just sat there and had a moment of silence and, and watched it.
one thing that actually I was thinking when I we were sitting there and the wreath was just kind of floating between us, I started kind of looking at the flowers and I was thinking to myself, oh, that's a guy, that's a guy, that's a guy. And that was hard to think about, but I'm glad we did it. To see the guys out there uh, to lay the wreath and the, the respects that they had for it and knowing how they feel about the Great Lakes and especially this opportunity, it was, it was amazing. The crazy thing was is as we were putting the uh, wreath in the water, uh, the sunlight literally went out really slowly. Um, dude, words can't describe how we're feeling right now. Then something unexpected happened. We floated over to get ready for the night. I'm sitting there with my feet in the water and I'm looking over and the wreath just sitting there. It doesn't want to move. We were drifting. The wreath was not. Something was holding it there. <laughs> they paid respect one last time. 17 miles to go. Daylight was just about gone. Night is when both safety boats need to be playing their A game. The dark brings cold, confusion, and a lot of time to think about how far you have to go. But night is Joe's favorite. Hey, is that a star? First star, second star. Need to do it. I like it. It's it's exciting. I'm normally a night person anyway. It's challenging. It's kind of the make or break. Oh, I don't get sunburn in the night. <laughs> so that might be like 50% of why I love the nighttime. Superior was still surprisingly calm. I'm trying to look at all these stars, it's awesome. Every one of your paddle marks in the water. Really? Oh, it looks freaking sweet. When you paddle, it leaves a white spot in the water. A beautiful night, but stressful for the captain of the David Boyd, Daryl Ortel. It got very dark. No moon at all. The most dangerous part of the trip was coming up. It's at night and we're crossing three shipping cha channels that are very heavily used. And definitely not for safety captain Ryan Matuzak. This is when things got, well, we'll just say a little sloppy. I need you guys to try and stay together this time instead of spreading out over 80 yards, okay? I gotta get Quinn to stay with, the, with one of the groups. See, the only lights we had that night was from the safety boats. If Quinn, Jeff, or Joe went beyond those, we couldn't see them. Ryan was not happy. We got too far out there. Did you see me? Yeah, we couldn't tell where you were at. You were so far back. We couldn't tell whether you were 100 yards or 40 yards. I was like 400 yards. Well, we can't tell the distance. I can't hear you over this motor. Yeah, I'm in trouble. If a guy gets too far away from the boat, something happens, and he were to fall off his board and hit his head on the board going into the water, in the dark, there is not a real good chance that we're going to get back there in time. I mean, we're going to try like hell, but let's just be honest. Someone, if you're not close enough for us to help you and you fall in, you know, they're wearing protective gear and they're wearing life or flotation suits, but it's still dark and you still got to get to them. So that's the thing that, that resonates so much with me is the fact that their families depend on myself and our team to make sure that they come back alive and there's a lot that goes into that. Safety is a major component of these crossings. That's why I slip into the survival suit. If I have to go in the water, I want to be able to stay in the water if necessary. Stay in there for whatever length of time is required. That cone of light around the boat, that's their safety zone where all eyes are on them. I wasn't going to let any of them get out of that. But they did. That's when Ryan had a bit of a come to Jesus meeting with the guys. In this video, he sounds a lot calmer than he really was. Hey boys, we need to go back to the program we've been doing for two paddles across the Great Lakes, which is staying together and tight, okay, in the dark. You guys gotta do a little bit of something to stay somewhat together. And I can't have you where I can't see you because I'm freaking out. And Ryan started to get a little, uh, little crunchy because we were straying a little too far from the boat. And I'm actually glad he, he did that because we were being a little uh, nonchalant. Ryan, we probably would have died on Michigan without him. Uh, we were gonna do it all, all wrong. The whole system that we have is because of him and we've done it right successfully three times. And Mike, he's the guy, like at night, he's sitting there like a sentry. You know, he's like right there in his dry suit 
If we even think about going in, I think he'd go in and give us mouth to mouth. I really do. The Shipwreck Society had just installed a FLIR camera. That's a camera that picks up hot spots. It was decided the guys would paddle behind Tyler's boat while the David Boyd watched from behind. And it was just like looking at the three paddle boarders in the boat as if it was daylight. I could see everything. If they would have dropped the paddle, I would have seen it. If a guy fell off the other boat, I would have seen it. That was a very good safety factor we added in this past winter. I told them how I felt about them and cared about them and told them about what their families had sent to me in the past and how much that I carried that with me on every one of these events. And uh, it meant a lot. They all told me they understood. To hear them say, yep, and just no arguments, no questioning. They understood and we all kind of said, oh yeah, you know, we need to do, we need to do this a little bit differently. Lake Superior is a big lake, but Quinn, Jeff, and Joe were in a funnel of sorts. We weren't the only ones headed to Whitefish Point. Pretty much loitering right in the, in the middle of I-75. Okay. Whitefish so, Point yeah. is the critical turning point for every freighter that's going upbound into Lake Superior or downbound into the Sioux Locks. If there was ever a traffic jam on Superior, we were in it. Six freighters passed us in a matter of a few hours. But you got the, the paddle borders, I believe, in the water? Yeah, they're crossing Lake Superior and their destination's Whitefish Point there at the lighthouse. Wow, well, it's uh, good timing. Oh, well, that's awesome, guys. You guys have a good one. Uh, good luck. Radio traffic up and down the lake started to spread. Every freighter that passed gave the guys plenty of room and good wishes. They didn't have to do that. All right, if I have to, I'll go to stop it a little bit more to uh, give you a wide berth. And for them to deviate their course and give us a wide berth uh, just shows like how much what we're doing means to people. We just had a good conversation with a couple of the freighters that are passing. Yeah. They wish you guys safe travels. They're going to give you some room. They were entertained by the fact that there's three guys trying to cross Lake Superior on the <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> somebody's entertained. Whitefish Point was in sight. The lighthouse doing what it's supposed to do. Guide mariners. That was actually very cool to be using that. Our lighthouse was our, our guiding light to, to bring everybody in and to round out this, this adventure. Paddling through the night with that beacon of hope, you know, the, the lighthouse. That's, it was nice because it's not just a lighthouse, it's the one that we're going to. It's where the museum is, and it's literally calling us with a flash of light. It was just around 5 a.m. July 11th, 2018. Family, friends, and supporters gathered at Whitefish Point to welcome the guys home. They're bragging, but exciting. They're amazing. Mind you, we get to Whitefish Point, and we stop, and we have a brief meeting with the guys and talk to them, and now there's enough light that we can see the shore. We can also see a lot of fishing nets. They were just offshore. Fishing nets prevented the boats from getting any closer. This was their final break. We are less than one mile from shore. It was also caught live on Michigan this morning. Thousands of people were watching. And you are taking a live look from Whitefish Point right now, and you can see Jeff Guy, Joe Lawrence, and Quinn Morris paddling their way to shore. Then something special, breathtaking happened. Because when you get to shore, it's a storm. People want to hug you, you know, it's crazy. So to be able to calm and sit and talk with just those two guys about what we did, and we're tearing up again, crying out there. And then the biggest freighter on the Great Lakes, one of the biggest freighters, goes by behind us. It was an emotion not lost on the guys or the people on shore, but now it was time for Quinn, Jeff, and Joe to end their adventure across Lake Superior. It was pretty special to see Melissa up on shore and also my parents and everybody else that made the trip because, I mean, it was 5.45 in the morning. It shows a lot of dedication. Three men from Stand Up for Great Lakes paddled close to 60 miles in less than 22 hours. It was anyone's guess as to why the lake was so calm. Was it a blessing from Mizupishu or just plain luck? You've got to see it to understand it. Um, the amount of human spirit exerted 
in this event is something that it's deeply touching. Take what you want from it, but maybe, just maybe, the respect and love these guys give to our lakes was given back. Something worth standing up for. Thank you, Lake Superior. <laughs> Thank you. They prepared for the absolute worst. They got the best. And they just crushed their carossing in a, a very, very sound manner. Cheers. So like Jeff said, the most we've raised and it is an honor for us to present this check to you for $15,000 today. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. The year-long adventure was over. When Jeff and Joe stood up and put their bodies to the test and raised $15,000 for the Great Lakes Shipwreck Historical Society. The whole route was planned to pay respects to this crew and this wreck site. They could have chosen a straight route to Whitefish Point. They chose one that came off of one of the most beautiful stretches of the shoreline you can imagine, paddled out to one of the most famous shipwreck sites in the world and finished it off by heading on their way to Whitefish Point, one of the most notorious weather locations on all the Great Lakes. <laughs> what a story. Kind of carved, and we're presenting that as a gift to the museum as well. So stand up for Green Lakes. 